the familiar network where you have an oscillator with a controllable amplitude. Amplitude, of course, you control by multiplying the output of the oscillator. That's, that's the easy way to do it. And the frequency of the oscillator you control by sending it in the appropriate input. So here is And if you want to sequence that, why don't you get some delay objects? So uh, maybe the good way to do this is give yourself a button, and then you can have delays. Oh, delay you can um, you can abbreviate as DEL. There are abbreviations for some of the most frequently used objects, and it's going to become important in this particular page. You can look, you'll see why. Have the button turn us on and have us be at 440. Uh, 440. Just gotta jump to 440. I'll tell you why in a second. You don't want to slide to necessarily slide to a note if you want to start a note at the beginning of something. You might want to have it just jump there. So this is now a button that makes sure that we're at 440 and turns us on. When you turn something off, you don't have to do anything to its pitch because just turning the amplitude of the thing by multiplying it by zero turns it off. It, it's still playing A440, this oscillator is, but we don't care about it. So now a Time you press the button, it will start this uh, sequence of delays going. And, right. and furthermore, here's a subtlety: when you uh, when you start a delay, if it was already started, it forgets the previous time it had been started for and resets it to the new time it was started for. That's a good way for objects for a delay object to behave because then it doesn't go off and do something in the wrong order because you told it to do something and change your mind later. If you change your mind about what you want to do, it is now only doing the new thing. Right. So you can actually believe that things are going to do what you ask them to when you start them. If you connect the delays this way. If you decide that you want to connect the delays back uh, one to successively one to the next, then that won't necessarily be true. Each one will set the next one off, and if you reset the first one, depending on what phase the others are in, they'll continue doing their things, and then you'll have different delays fighting each other for control of your oscillators, which will not be as good. So it is a good thing to not to daisy chain your delays, but to have them all come off of the same source like that. And now I'm going to make beautiful music. That's going to be nothing. Oh, it's going to be a rest. Yeah, we'll just do it And then we'll go down there, and then we'll wait another second. I won't even put the next delay in. 2,500. And here we'll go back down to A, and here we'll shut up. Now, here's one of the things that it's problematic about patching, and I will show you strategies later to deal with this. Your patches get messy after you've done a certain amount of stuff. 
Uh, okay, technique number one, turn the font size down. Uh, other techniques are going to be use more than one window, but I haven't shown you how, and also use names for things so that everything doesn't have to be a connection. I haven't shown you how to do that yet either, but that's all coming. So now if I, if my, if I can just write, I'll have this beautiful composition. Right. Ta-da, the marching demons of Wizard of Oz. Okay, so this is how to make sequences that do things like control and amplitude sequences. Questions about this, what I did and why? Yeah? I forgot, for the first number in continuous numbers, is frequency, do you have a point of three there? <coughs> oh, okay, yes, right. So that's a, the that's a thing. These, these, are, these numbers, what they are, depends on where you put them. Or rather, how they're interpreted depends on what you, where you put them. So these numbers are frequency by virtue of the fact that they're talking through this line of this oscillator. These numbers are amplitudes because they are talking through this line, which is getting multiplied by the oscillator. So even though the data goes down, in some sense, meaning bubbles up. So it's yeah. a tiny line that goes amplitude and then time. Right. Or value in time, or target in time. I think of it as target because it's the place where the line will, will eventually be, or the thing the line will eventually be emitting, I guess is the right word, after the amount of time has elapsed. So another process determines on what they're uh, lined up to. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? No? Okay, I'll leave this and get on to fun topics. Not that this isn't a fun topic, but there are other fun topics. Uh, I don't have a I'll just do save as, remember the font size, and I'll start all over again. Three, uh, table oscillator, oh no, wait, I, want to, um, I neglected to tell you a bunch of things last time. Uh, yes, right, table oscillators first, and then units, psychoacoustic units, which is MIDI units of pitch versus frequencies and decibels versus the linear amplitudes, which I will show you after I show you the basic yoga of table lookup in computer music, well, phase generation and table lookup, which is how oscillators are made, which is the bread and butter of computer music. And the fact that it's taken me five classes to get here says something either about the indirectness with which I'm approaching the thing or the fact that perhaps it is actually more complicated than I'm, than I'm thinking to myself it was supposed to be. Okay, so we're going to do phase and tables. Object whose name is phaser, which generates phases. This, these are not useful things to listen to. In fact, let me prove to you that this is not useful to listen to. But this is a bad sound. The reason is, the reason that sounds like a mosquito is is uh, what's called fold. -over. Well, there are several reasons it sounds like a mosquito, but the, the the reason it sounds bad in computer music ears is because of fold over the fact that. This signal is not a good band limited signal that is limited to 22 kilohertz and a half. It is, um, it is a, an unband limited signal that has theoretically an infinite trail of partials. And in a digital environment, such as any computer music environment, you will hear various kinds of <coughs> badness happen. And what it sounds like is just a not, exact, not exactly stable quality of the signal. Like it's fluttering a little bit, that is fold over. <coughs> there are better examples of fold over that I could show you, but they would be piercingly ugly to listen to, and I don't really want to deal with them. Go, go look at the PD documentation, you'll see a wonderful fold over generating patch, which will make you jump out of your chair and spit out your gum. Okay, so, um, so, this, so now, why am I showing you this then? Because you use it to do things like look up wave tables. So uh, to, to show you this, I have to get out a nice array so that you can see what's happening. So I'll do that now. 
Sorry for getting repetitive, but it's what it is. Chamber AG, and then it's a nice table of writers. Wow, but I shouldn't really get into one name, should I? Great, uh, 1.18a. I don't want these to fight with each other if you happen to load more than one of these up while you're looking at old patches, which is why I'm making awful names. I'll show you a better way later. Okay, so now, what does the phaser do that makes here? Hey, I'll move you. Oh, yeah. <coughs> I thought it was me. It actually was me, but it was a deeper level. Okay, here's a, uh, oh, let's push the picking together. Here's a sawtooth wave. Notice how there are bad kinks in this. That's actually graphics, but there are bad kinks in the thing because sometimes when the thing wraps around, actually, let's go to 440. Sometimes when the thing wraps around, since we're 4,000, let's see. Since we are 44,100 points per second, 440 hertz means how many samples? per cycle, a hundred and a fraction, I think, if I'm doing this right. So it's about a hundred samples long. Oh yeah, it's about a hundred samples long because the table is about a hundred samples big. But if I, um, but it's not exactly a hundred samples long from the bottom to the top. It's just that sometimes it's a hundred samples and sometimes it's a hundred and one samples. It's not a decent periodic signal, really. It's a it's a sawtooth wave being represented digitally, and it sounds bad. Okay. What, what you do to it to make it sound good is you use it to look up a table. Yes. And here's object number two for today. These are uh, phaser and, and cosine are both objects. Oops, cosine. Are objects that you haven't seen yet. The cosine takes whatever goes into it and reports its cosine or outputs its cosine. Sinusoid. <laughs> it's a cosine and not a sine because cosine is the simple function and sine is the complicated function <coughs> to deal with. And there's only one wave table, so it became cosine. So what so an oscillator really, you, you've seen this as OSC tilde. OSC tilde is in some sense equivalent to phaser and cosine. Phaser is an object which just generates a phase which goes from left to right, if you like, a certain number of times a second to specify, for instance, by an in input. And cosine is a table lookup which, if you give it zero, gives you one. If you give it a half, it gives you minus one. And if you give it one, it gives you one again. And I happened to click it just as a mo at a moment when it was going from zero to one in the uh, space of the window, but if I do it again, you will see that in fact it's just moving continuously. That was an accident. Okay. Click. All right. Now, this is interesting because you don't have to use cosines. You can use other waveforms. And what would be another good waveform? Well, for instance, I could ask for a I could ask for the cosine of twice the thing, which would be two uh, cycles of the cosine wave. I'm going to do that like this. Multiply the phaser by two so that it doesn't sweep from zero to one, it sweeps from zero to two. And then Well, twice as fast, that might be confusing. What's really happening is, think of this as a function. This function is the cosine of twice the input, which is to say it doesn't just go from 1 to minus 1 to 1. Once, as, as the phaser's output goes from 0 to 1, as the phaser's output goes from 0 to 1, this goes from 0 to 2, and so this thing goes from two cycles. So you were looking up the second harmonic. So now you can do harmonic uh, well, now you can do groups of harmonically uh, related sinusoids. You can build up tones out of out of the 
out of amplitude of individual harmonics by combining cosine and a cosine of the octave and a cosine of the twelfth and so on like that until you get tired of making a patch. So this is this is a very simple uh, what's the right word? A very simple example of using wave tables which are or, using waveforms, specifying waveforms, which are things which you index by giving it a number from 0 to 1, such as phaser does repeatedly, or repeatedly at some number of times per second given by its frequency. Phaser has memory. It has to remember its phase from sample to sample, so it is in effect an integrator. You, uh, the frequency that you put in tells it how much it's going to add to each previous sample to make the next one. And cosine doesn't have any memory. It's just a pure function that takes whatever you put in and puts something out. So phaser is the real oscillator here, and cosine is a is a wave table that the oscillator is indexing. And furthermore, this combination of phaser and cosine is what you previously have known as OSC tilde. All right. Now I told you that, so I can tell you this next thing. Um, you can make your own tables up. And here's where, at least in some respects, things start to get fun. So, I'm going to make the window as big as I possibly can so that I can keep going in 16 point font and hopefully make something that can be understood. I'm going to make another table. And I'm going to give it, yeah, I didn't think in advance. I'm going to give it eight points. Yeah. And this is now going to be a, a what? Table. Okay. okay. That's a bad thing. Everything's bad about this. Okay. Did you grab? We're happy. Okay. Everything's good. Uh, now, Last time I did this, I really forgot that I asked it to do the thing with points and just check that it really did. Forgot. Okay. Now we have something which we can edit and it's just a bunch of numbers, eight of them. All right. So you've seen all this before, except I don't know if you've seen me draw on one, but that's one way of getting things into the table. There are other ways. You can have text in a file. You can, well, you can if you want to, say your properties, and somewhere in here it gives you the opportunity to. What is the way you get the thing by? Oh my God, never mind that. Looking for a feature that is. <coughs> okay, I'll, I'll show you how to get numbers in there in, in, in a good way later. That's going to be a whole other thing. All right, so I just put, I just put a waveform in here, and now. What I can do is say, oh, let's listen to it, by, okay. Some pedagogical sense tells me I should do this first. We're going to read out of the table, and the table is going to be tab dot one dot one eight a. Notice I did not put a tilde in. I'm going to do this just with messages to start with because it's going to be easier to understand what's going on. And then I'm going to add a tilde and then we're going to be operating with this. Right. So, number So I'm using a Macintosh keyboard on the machine. The little Apple key doesn't mean anything to me. I think it's an apple. Okay, so I give it numbers like zero, and it gives me this value. And I give it a number one, and it gives me this value, and so on like that. And now I can just go sweeping through the thing, looking at the values in the table. Okay, so we got storage. You know, you have, yeah. Not only storage, but storage of as many numbers as you want to put in the array. Yeah. How come when you go negative, it leaves you? Thank you. Yes. What happens when I go off the end of the table is it says, well, that's okay. I'll just give you the closest point to what I, to what you had. So in general, PD's approach to errors 
this is not good computer science, is it just puts guardrails on everything. So if you divide by zero, it doesn't give you an error, it just gives you zero. Uh, <coughs> try to read off the array. Actually, there, there are several things it could have done. It doesn't give you an error because then you wouldn't hear anything. It's better to hear something that's wrong than not to hear anything. Uh, you could also say that if I gave you a negative value, the thing that you should do is wrap around to the other end as if you were an end endlessly repeating waveform. That is done using a different object in PV. The table doesn't do that, and if you want that, you have to use an object called wrap, which I will introduce later when we need it. Instead, uh, it simply says, if you're between zero and seven, it will read the value out of the table, and if you're in excess of seven or below zero, it will simply give you the last or the first value. Which is good enough for us right now. Furthermore, <laughs> if I give it a number like uh, let's see, if I give it zero, it's the first value, oh, it's the last value, it's seven, because there are eight numbers. That's one possible way of counting. That's modular arithmetic way of counting. Uh, the other thing is if I give it a half, what should it do? That's a trick question on two levels. <laughs> yeah? You give it a one, or is it Yeah, be between this and this. So you could... You could just do what you said, which is to say, just call it one or call it zero. Oh, and then should you round? In other words, if, if I give it a half, should it round it up to one, or should it just truncate it down to zero? Also, another thing that, yeah. Does it do interpolation? Another thing it could do is interpolation. But then the question is, how many points interpolation should you do? And if it's two point, there's really only one good interpolation algorithm, but when you have four or eight points, there might be several different ways of interpolating that have different properties. So it just doesn't. So if I give it numbers between zero and one, it declines to act smart, simply so truncates to zero and gives you that value. Until I hit one at this point, it gives me the next value and so on. So so if you're going to go below this number now, is it, is it down down, or is it just down to one which just down? It down is down. Right. Oh, yes. So it doesn't have <coughs> memory again. There's no, it doesn't know what I asked it previously. So it does, so everything is that there's no yesterday, and, and it always rounds toward minus infinity. Actually, in table land, it only counts from zero, so it rounds towards zero, we'll call it. Okay. If you wanted to, and, yeah. Uh, Oh, can you input the numbers in the Is, uh, yes. Let, um, I'm trying to decide, yeah, I'm trying to decide which is the best way to show you to do that, which requires the least constructs. <laughs> there are about five ways of doing it. <laughs> and I didn't realize I was going to have to do that today, so I didn't think in advance about which one to show you, so I'm going to have to, I'll get back to that. You, you will eventually want to be able to do things like throw values on the table. Uh, oh, there's a tab right tilde you've seen here, so you can guess there might be a tab right. But it's not. Remind me to get back to this. Tab right is not tab right tilde without a tilde. It doesn't turn out to make sense to just write sequentially through the table in message land, so it works differently. All right, so here's tab read. Now, you could say tab v tilde. And now that you've heard everything that you've heard, you know exactly what will happen when I run a phaser into tab v tilde and then listen to the result. Why don't I hear anything? Do I look surprised that I don't hear anything? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not trying to project surprise here. <coughs> okay. Okay, what are the values coming out of the phaser? Zero to one. Not inclusive. And what does table, or what does tab read do? It rounds down to the nearest integer. The nearest integer down is always zero. So you're getting out solid, whatever that number was, minus point twenty one, And the mixer is then forgetting it because it's a couple. So if I want to hear something, I would take this phaser and multiply its output by the size of the table. Right. 
the thing. Um, you will learn various ways of making your patches not occupy a huge amount of space. One thing that I do, but you don't have to, is when you're multiplying by a line, you put the line next to the multiplier instead of above it. And if you do that consistently, then you learn to expect it, and then it looks normal when you do this, even though this line looks like it's going up. Okay, so this is the way I normally do this when I'm working. All right, now I'm going to say, multiply by the size of the table to the oh, point for the space. Hey, oh, sorry. I need a tilde because I need a signal multiplier to figure the signal coming out of it. And now, this is sounding better than the table did, but sounds yet because there are discontinuities in the table. Isn't, isn't our table yeah. going from uh, 0 to 7 though, instead of... Ah, thank you. Right. So why am I going up to 8? It's because if I went from 0 to 7, you would never hear this last value because the phaser would go from 0 to 7, but it would never get to 7 because that would the exact value. 7 would wrap it down to 0. So if I don't read the entire table, I want to go all the way to 8, even though not only the table stopped at 7. So it's confusing for two reasons that cancel each other out. There are 8 things in the table, so 0 to 8 sounds natural until you realize that actually they're indexed from 0 to 7. So it sounds like you should go and leave 7. But then, in truth, you should still go to 8 because otherwise you wouldn't get any of the seven because you could not do it. Is that clear? That's either clear or not, depending on whether you can follow about three different facts that I introduced in the last half hour all at once. Okay, so you can think of it as, you can think of the horizontal axis here as going from zero to eight. In fact, I think of it that way, even though the place where the individual points live are just the integers from 0 to 8, which are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, but not 8, because then there would be 9 of them. And furthermore, for it to spend just as much time, if you like, between 7 and 8 as it does between 0 and 1, you should multiply the phasor output by the whole number of 8, the number of points 8. This will change when we start interpolating the table because then there will be fewer values that are useful, but that will that will happen later. Uh, next thing about this, what if let's see, no, the one way of getting values into the table? Well, we can do it. Let's put a sinusoid in here. Uh, I'm going to be a little sloppy, but not terribly sloppy. We're going to say oscillator, and I'm going to give it a frequency which is equal to the sample rate over 8 so that its period in samples is 8, right? And I'm going to be lazy and say, give me a message box, oh, give me a message box which gives me the sample rate, which I happen to, which I believe to be 44,100. And then I will say divide by 8, the number of samples in the table. That will be the frequency for an oscillator, and then I'm going to be right back into the which we have given away. This is called tab. It's really confusing terminology, but I'm going to let it. Okay, let it, and there is our nice semi slug. Oh, I get this all, but I get this here so you can see it. Oh, yeah, I started this oscillator up. And I started the oscillator up, and it had initial phase zero, and its frequency happens to be such that it repeats every eight samples. So every single time I whack the button, it will see it on a 64 sample boundary for technical reasons. And I'm always going to see that a phase is magically zero here. That is a, that is a weird accident. And now I've got a nice table which will sound just like a sinusoid when I play it for you. Not, right? This is this is in fact not.
not a sinusoid, but it is the function which is, as, which is the same point as a sinusoid every eighth of a cycle, but flat everywhere between it. And that's not a that's not very sinusoidal. If you did a Fourier analysis of this, if you did a Fourier analysis of this, you would see mostly a nice sinusoid, but then you would see a very jagged difference between that and the sinusoid it's imitating. And that jagged function would have lots of high frequency information in it, which would sound like <coughs> that kind of stuff. It's even better because now if I go up in frequency, well, it's hoping to make you hear full number, but it's not quite that bad. Um, all right, how would you make that better? Put in more points, maybe. Right? So now we can say. <coughs> Yeah. Okay. So let's get the properties out. And I'm going to say I don't want three points. I want I don't know uh, 1,024. I'm just thinking. I'm just making up a number. Oh, I don't. I don't have to use the power of two if I don't want to. So let's make it a thousand. That's just a bad reflex of mine. So, thousand points. Okay. <coughs> Uh, now, the points that were there are there, and it's going to sound horrible to listen to it. Oh, oh no, it doesn't because I'm going to use the first date, but now I'm going to use the thousand of them. All right, first I'm going to put a sinusoid in. More. Oh, I have to do it. Okay, there's a good sinusoid with lots of points in it, right? And now, um, I have to remember to change this eight to one thousand. Now, maybe sinusoid. Don't buy this sinusoid. This sounds good under our current listening conditions, but if you think about it, the error here is going to be on the order of a thousand. Well, it's going to the phase is going to be off by a thousandth of a cycle or so. So there's going to be a little lookup error in the amount that you'll get here, which will be something like two pi over. That sounds quiet, but that's about a part in a hundred. In other words, this thing might be making errors that are on the order of a part in a hundred. And that is loud. That's minus 40 dB. And if you want to if you want to hear it, to prove that that's bad, I will give you that at much lower frequencies. And then you will hear a characteristic computer music error. <coughs> Make it in at one. Yep. All right, start with 55 hertz. I don't get anything wrong yet. <coughs> Anyone hear bacon frying in here? I don't hear anything wrong. I guarantee you you'll hear the problem if you, if you listen to this carefully. I'm going to turn this, I'm going to turn the whole thing up to prove that this is bad. Leave it there, and I'm going to turn the volume up a little bit. And we'll see if we can actually read it probably before I just go to the speakers. Maybe I'm never going to move. Stuff. All right. When when you're in a in a good listening environment, you will hear that a lot louder than you hear it here with all these fans and everything else. And that what that is is about 40 decibels down from the sound of the sinusoid. But I moved the sound of the sinusoid out of the way so that all you hear is the 40 decibel down nonsense. And it's kind of bad. Wrong. Furthermore, it's still there when you do this kind of stuff. You might be able to hear it, you might not. But if you listen to this in a good studio, you will hear it, and it will not be appropriate. It will not be a good thing. Furthermore, that was only uh, that was only me, 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 
nice uh, sinusoid here. And of course, the reason we're doing table lookup is so that we can do other stuff besides sinusoids. And other stuff besides sinusoids has higher harmonics in it, perhaps. So, in fact, what about the uh, what about if, if the signal that I put in here had a little bit of energy independent harmonic? Then what would I be listening to? So whatever you put into that wavetable, the tenth harmonic didn't sound like a sinusoid, it sounded like that thing. And the hundredth harmonic sounded a whole lot worse. Yeah? Question. All right, so table lookup is not the panacea that, well, sorry. Table lookup is not trouble free. You have to, you have to pay your dues and figure out how you're going to use this effectively. And cosine tilde, that one is a table lookup that happens to be a cosine that's worked out in such a way that it gives you 19 bits of precision, which is usually good enough. And so if you don't, if, if you can live with cosines, you will not have to deal with this situation. But there are moments when you will have to do real table lookup. In particular, as soon as you have a sample going into the computer, as soon as you're doing a recording, putting a recorded sound in here and then playing that back using an oscillator or using a sampler, you will have to deal with uh, the issue of how well you're interpolating it and what kind of numerical accuracy you're getting out. Right. We can avoid that for right now because we're just using, uh, well, basically because we're not going to be careful about that yet. I'm going to show you that, I think, next week when we get into how to do sampling. And right now, I'll just go back to, okay, it was good, and now we can have a quick uh, look at what waveforms sound like. generate phases, and which is done by, typically by eventually a phaser object at some point in, inside your patch. So it's going to be one of these generating phase. And then at some point you are um, designing or finding waveforms. You could be adding up partials uh, to, to make a Fourier synthesized waveform, or you could be recording a waveform, or you could have some for some other reason. And that you typically find its way into storage, into an array, <coughs> and then you look the array up using the phaser. In other words, the phaser generating the index that changes in the array is setting, is telling you what the waveform is, and then you're playing it, and then you're making a tone whose timbre depends on the waveform and whose amplitude and frequency depend on the on what you multiply the phaser by the output. Sorry, the table is up by the output. So here I'm controlling amplitude, and here I'm controlling frequency. Frequency control is going into the phaser, and the amplitude control is happening at the output of tambourine tilde. And these three objects are replacing the one object OSC tilde, the oscillator. Deal with that, right? Okay, and now we can do all the here. So, uh, all right, so let me save this and then make another one. So I can get rid of some of this. So 
So tables can be uh, can be waveforms, or they can be other computer music items. And one thing that you could imagine wanting to do is make this thing be either the amplitude or the pitch of something changing in time. Right, let's make it amplitude to start with, because that'll be easier to hear. And then I'll show you how you can control the pitch using a table. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm going I'm to make a nice envelope. And now, okay, so that's a, so now we have an oscillator, and I'm going to tell the oscillator to go very slowly. But rather than listen to this as the output, I'm going to regard this as, as the amplitude of something else. Uh, what? I need that. I need that. So we're going to take this and. Just by convention, I've been putting amplitudes to the right, so I'll continue doing that. Like this. So I'm giving myself a way to turn the thing on and off, too. But meanwhile, I'm going to multiply a regular old oscillator by this. This phaser's values are outputting from, is outputting values from 0 to 1. And the table needs an input which is in points. And there are 1,000 points here. So this is, this is adjusting the range, which is the size of this table. Okay. Or another example, this is more along the lines of, of classic electronic music. Let's go back and this is kind of a bad example, but I'll look at it anyway just to leave a bad message as well as this is for a bad example. And now, <coughs> table controlling pitch, why not? Uh, here, oh, I haven't been changing the name of the table before. Well, I have to get the properties out anyway because I have to change the points. I'm going to change it back to. that's reading this table and it's, and it's giving us values right now that are ranging from minus one to one. Oh, let's say we're going to change the table. Let's make it have a uh, let's make it have a range of appropriate frequencies, which might be from I don't know a thousand to one, which is zero. Okay. Now they're all everything at the bottom of the table. Right? Here's how to can write a zero without any logic. Should be 118 uh, D. Sorry, I'm just trying to get this thing here where I can edit it. Okay, let's. Oh, thank you. That didn't do anything either. 
how about I just um, go with some value of the zero? This might be good. Um, all right. Yes. Okay. All right. Now this is nothing to listen to. It would be um, these values are now ranging from zero to a thousand, so they are too big to use for amplitude, but they're perfectly good to use for frequencies. So we could, for instance, instead of using this as the amplitude of the oscillator, we can use the frequency of the oscillator. And. An analog sequencer, even though it's digital, uh, because the way analog sequencers used to work is they used to have a, a collection typically of 12, <coughs> occasionally of 16 voltages that you would set with knobs, and then you would give it usually a trigger to uh, ask it to advance to the next voltage. That was, that's analog synth for. So, this is how to make that sort of thing using digital technology. And by the way, everything is in hertz, so this is from zero to a thousand. And this kind of doesn't work very well for specifying pitches. In fact, you'll notice that all the pitches were within a couple of octaves of each other. That's because from a quarter of the way up to all the way up is two octaves. Right? Because each octave is doubling. So if this is a thousand and an octave down, it's 500 and an octave down, it's 250. So this is an ugly scale to be trying to do musical pitches on. That's going to bring me to the next topic, which is units in computer music. All right. So now, what you've seen so far in 45 minutes is two objects, really. Well, maybe three. Mostly two. Phaser tilde and tab lean tilde. Whose jobs are to remember where you are and to scan through something, which is the basic thing an oscillator does, and to hold and, and retrieve values. And these values, so far, you know how to get them in by using tab right tilde. And I'm going to tell you another way as soon as I figure out which is the best way. But I'm going to do units first, because we need units badly now. So that you can start making music. Oh, yeah. So just try to make this thing do a C major scale. Well, first off, for 12 notes, it's not a good choice. Um, oh, so let's just use the first eight points. Oh, yeah, right. So nobody said that you had to use the entire table. So, I turn this to some smaller number. Oops, sorry. Smaller number, six. And it's just looking at the first six guys at the table. Now I've got something very powerful in eight because if we add to this. Say, look at three points, it's doing 
three points per second, but if I tell it to do 12, it's doing 12 points per second, right? Yeah? Two? Let's, get, let's, let's try 440. <laughs> okay. So, uh, all right, so let's see. Let's turn it on again. First off, two. second, you don't hear them as individual events. And so all you can possibly hear them as is sound, I guess. And so now we're changing the sound of the thing by playing a supersonic melody. Francisco Tate Music Center, if you happen to belong to a certain generation. Many of those people are still alive, by the way. You can send them email. Questions about this? Is it clear what I just did? Yeah. I'm, I'm not too clear on the bus totally. You said it kind of moved the window. OK, um, yeah. Right, okay, so, so meaning in some sense bubbles up from the bottom in the sense that halfway <coughs> tilde, I have to provide it a number which will tell it where it's going to look. Now, those, so you can think of those numbers as living horizontally from 0 up to 11 and then 12 at the end, which it's never a different number. Really, 0 to 11 and the of 0 to 12. Numbers. And now, if I say, for instance, take the phaser which ranges from 0 to 1 and multiply it by 5. Then I'm going from 0 to 5, which means I'm adding to the first 5 points of the table. If I add now 2 to that, it adds 2 to those points to, the, to that range. Well, actually, it adds 2 to every value, which de facto adds 2 to the range of possible values that, that the result occupies. And in that case, the phaser, or after I've done that, the phaser, which went from 0 to 1, goes from 0 to 5, now it goes from 2 to 7. And therefore, reads points two, three, four, five, and six, um, which are five points in the table. And then the number twelve is that arbitrary or that unique? that's arbitrary, arbitrary slash historical. Okay. If, if you go look at an old synth, they typically have twelve or something. Right. Okay. 
Yeah. So just to make sure you, you need a tab right to um, mess around with the graph. I'm, I'm running this uh, version 43 test 3, which doesn't right, actually same. edit the thing when the graph goes outside of the bounds, and I had a negative number in there, and I changed the range so that I couldn't edit any more. So I threw that in so I could just bash it to a constant. But now, but now that I have it, it's kind of useful because I can now say, just play A440, please. Now I have a sequence that consists of A440. Or, in fact, I could, if, no, let's not do that. I was going to put some message boxes in and try to make a nice sequence of pitches in the table, but then I realized that I'd have to press them all within a few 44,000 of a second. It wasn't going to work terribly well. Yeah? So uh, the oscillator that's connected to the tab read, is that 220? Oh, thank you. Yeah, that 220 is obsolete. Okay. It got overridden by the, by the input. Yeah. <laughs> so if you input something that can also that already has a value? So it forgets the value and, yeah. and adopts the value. Ahead, except that if I took the in, if I disconnected the input, it would jump back to the 220, and then you would be even more confused. Yeah. So it's best not to have that 220 there. <coughs> Bad style. Okay, so take this one here. Yeah. yeah. So the its size is 12. I don't mind saving the content because it'll add 48 bytes to the thing. Maybe. And um, the range, okay, so the X range is from 0 to 12. The Y range, oh, by the way, if you change this, and if it agrees with this range, when you change it, it will update this range for you. So you don't set that particularly. And here I wanted to go from 1,000 at the top to 0 at the bottom. Which is a reasonable you know, range of pitches, but not the only possible range. All right, now, let's see. I'm going to next talk about units. And to do that, I think what I have to do. I'm going to save this now as, as patch number seven because I'm going to have to have a patch number six in the middle. <coughs> so by the time we get to seven, we're going to be putting MIDI numbers into the table instead of frequencies in hertz, which will make everyone breathe a sigh of relief. But meanwhile, uh, let's go back one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, by the way, um, I haven't. I believe it's true that the patches from last Thursday are on the website, but if you look and don't see them, it's because I forgot to put them up and I need to. Yeah. So they're not there? I need to put them up. I'm sorry. I'm forgetful. Okay, six. Uh, okay, so now we're just going to talk about units. And to talk about units, we can do stuff. But we still need our nice oscillator and our nice multiplier. Yeah. Same thing as always. Now, uh, the, the objects of interest are as follows. The one that is the easiest to understand probably is MIDI to frequency and its, and its uh, companion frequency to MIDI. MIDI to frequency, you give it a number, And out comes the frequency in hertz that would correspond to that value in MIDI. So, for instance, 40, uh, sorry, 69 is the MIDI number which is associated with A above middle C, and that is well, sometimes called A440. And so, this is a pitch, and this is a value in hertz. The pitches are good to use because you can look at two of them and know exactly what the interval is between them. Here's what the what the musical distance is between them. Uh, you can't necessarily do that with two of these numbers, like if I gave you 261.62 in this, you wouldn't necessarily know right off the bat that that's a major sixth if I've got it right. But here, if I say, okay, give me a major sixth, that's the thing from 60 to 69. And you can know that. 
So for instance, if you want to make oscillators make a chord, oh, first off, before I even do that, let's just play this. I'm too lazy to get the piano out, but if I whacked A, I believe I would hear the same pitch as I hear here. There is one situation in which that would be true, which is if I was wrong about the sample rate of my conversion hardware. Probably there. Okay. So now, for instance, if I want to go up a musical sixth, I add seven to this number. <laughs> Much easier job than multiplying by one and a half. <coughs> if I want to go up a musical third, that's easier than multiplying by that ratio, which is a number you all know from acoustics. That's a tempered major third as an interval, or as a ratio. I guess I'm going. That's. That's not the easiest possible computation you can do in acoustics, yeah? How did you uh, change the numbers? Oh, how did I change them so quickly? I click on this thing, then I start typing. And then I hit enter. And I've had a lot of practice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 12 half steps are a factor of 2, so 4 half steps is a factor of 2 to the 1 third, because 4 is a third of 12. So it's the cube root of two is a musical major third tempered. <laughs> That's weird, isn't it? A tritone is the easiest one of all, besides an octave. Even though it's the worst interval, it's the square root of two. Six half steps out of twelve. They're all irrational, except for the octave. All right. Uh, let's see. So now, for instance, to okay. So so here, to make, for instance, a nice major chord, just to, just as an example, you could say, all right, I will take this frequency and I will multiply it by. 1.25 and by 1.5, that's 5 over 4, and then it is 3 over 2. And those are the musical perfect third and, and perfect fifth. Perfect major third and perfect fifth. Now let's see if this is going to work for me. Okay, as long as you're doing tempered chords and you happen to know those numbers. Uh, more musicians know the, these numbers in half step, and they would rather do the video. Let's do the whole thing instead of in frequency and pitch. Where going up a major third is not multiplying by a ratio, which is what you do to frequencies, but if you adding a number of steps, because pitch is in steps or in notes. What do you say? In steps. I don't know what better word you use. Okay, so here we would say plus how many half steps in a major third? Four. And in a fifth? Seven. This is a tricon. And this might or might not be easier to use. <coughs> and by the way, it is no longer a perfect major chord, it is a major chord. It sounds different, especially here because there's some distortion. If there weren't any distortion, I don't think you'd hear that many. Yeah. What's the 69 again? Oh, thank you. The 69, <coughs> this is the MIDI pitch which corresponds to A440. I should probably tell you about the MIDI scale. That's, our, that's pre specified already. That's pre specified. That was specified by the Musical Instrument Digital Interface Standards Board back in the 80s. 
So this is this is basically never going to change. 60 is middle C. Why 60? Because they wanted all the pitches to be positive numbers. In fact, they wanted to fit the whole thing in a seven uh, word. So everything is between zero and 127. The definition of MIDI pitch is that 60 is middle C, and values that are not 60 are counting away from middle C, up or down in half steps. So, so a major chord in at middle C, and going up a half step is added one. sharps and the other two don't. <laughs> All that stuff. It's just stuff we inherited from people who thought differently from how we did. Also, okay, so I hope I hope you prefer typing 64 and 70 to typing 261.62. Oh, well, you don't see the whole thing there. Right? Yeah, those numbers, which are frequencies that I don't have to know. Um, right, and just for the sake of being a sort of Thorough, there is, if you ever want to get back, there is a frequency to MIDI, and that will do this for you. It'll figure out what you have to say in order to get a given frequency. So if I happen to know that uh, the thing that I'm listening to, let's see. To avoid confusing, to avoid reusing the number 60. Suppose we're in Europe and we've got line currents for this one too, which is 50 hertz. So that is pitch 31.35, which is let's see, 36 is a C, so 31.35 is a, a G a little bit north, which is the sound of a ground loop in Europe. So hertz to MIDI to hertz. If, the, if you have an integer here, you are not always going to get an integer here. In the, uh, the only situation that both these happens to happen to be an integer is when you use numbers like 220 or 440, which correspond to A, which is 69 or 57 or 45, etc. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, so what's what's MIDI zero here? It is um, eight hertz and, and change. So if you want something to go at four hertz, you have to say go down an octave from zero MIDI, which is minus twelve MIDI. Isn't that horrible? And this is a perfectly reasonable vibrato rate. In fact, a good vibrato rate is minus six or so, right? Uh, by the time you get up into non-negative MIDI frequencies, you are really too fast for doing nice vibrato. Okay. Why did they do that? Because pitch originally was supposed to live on an 88 key keyboard, because this was invented by instrument manufacturers. They bought about seven keyboards. So invent a seven bit protocol that can describe 88 keys. You could do that in a variety of ways, like you could count the bottom of the piano as being zero. But what they wanted was for middle C, well, for C's in general to be multiples of 12. That makes the arithmetic easy. So then you could make the bottom of the piano be minus three. No, you can't do negative numbers. It's an A, usually. So then it could be nine. And, but in fact, they made it 21, so that middle C would be about halfway up the range from zero to 127, I guess. Anyway, it, it works OK. So the highest, the highest frequency that you can talk MIDI into talking about, oh, two big things in the box. I can set the uh, width of the number box. I 
occasionally you have to. So you'll have trouble specifying pitches above. Ooh, that was the wrong way. Fifty-seven, male You can't describe things in, in classical MIDI, uh, hardware MIDI above this pitch here, which is not going to bother many musicians. Oh, and by the way, zero, even though 80 hertz is, is frequency, it's subsonic. So we didn't cover the range of hearing decently well, although not perfectly. And of course, you can go out of the range negatively, and you can also go out of the range positively. So for instance, 200 MIDI is almost a megahertz. A, a thousand MIDI <coughs> is almost 10 to the 26th hertz. It's exponential. Every time you add 12 here, you're doubling this number. Oh, here? Oh, I just clicked on it and said 1000, enter. And then it did it for me. Yeah. Oh, oh, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right, so I, I was getting this thing because my number box by default is only five units wide. And I went into properties and told it to make this one eight units wide so that I could see bigger numbers. It's a trade off screen space versus range of numbers you can see. Actually, five is almost never the right number. It's almost always either three or else it's eight. Five is almost a, an anti, what do you say? It's almost the local minimum of use of utility. And, and of course, minus a thousand maybe is a very low frequency, like once in the age of the universe type frequency. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's frequent, that's units of frequency and pitch. So MIDI is a unit of pitch, and, you, and, and that's suitable for describing musical intervals, because when you add some fixed number of steps to a pitch, you move by a fixed musical interval, no matter what you want. Whereas frequency has a, has a more dubious range. It ranges, the audible frequencies anyway, roughly speaking, range from 20 to 20,000. Uh, so it's it's a more unruly scale for typing numbers in, uh, and you know, that's all I should say about that. Oh, if you want to have an interval, you multiply the frequency by a number to get an interval from it, as opposed to adding. And this is in fact exponentiation. It's it's a normalized kind of exponentiation, so that adding here is the multiplying here, because when you add something to something that you're going to exponentiate with multiply. Yeah. All right? Similarly to pitch and MIDI, we have objects for doing um, amplitudes. And I've been using these numbers like 0 0.03 for amplitudes all quarters so far. Now we can start using amplitudes in decibels, which might also be a nice range from 0 to 100-ish. So the objects in question are, I'll just copy this whole thing. It's called decibels to root mean square. That's a horrible name, isn't it? And then root mean square to decibels. Um, uh, I don't know a better name for these, but this is not a good name. 100 decibels. <laughs> Uh, corresponds to one volt, if you like. And then every increment of 20, sorry, every increment of 10 dB is a multiple of 10 in power. <coughs> multiplying 10 by, multiplying power by 10 means multiplying amplitude by square root of 10. Because power is proportional to the square of linear amplitude. A good measure of linear amplitude is root mean square, which means the square root of the average of the squares of the sample. Mean means average in this context. So the root mean square is take your signal, square it, take the mean, and then take the square root of it. That's what that's what the letters RMS stand for. And decibels to RMS means get this thing and make it fast, or get uh, 90, which is 10 fewer, 
and turn it into 1 over the square root of 10, which you all know by heart. And then 80 then becomes 1 over the square root of 10 squared, <coughs> because we divided by square root of 10 twice. And that means dividing by 10. And now you can see why it's a reflex of the mind to always say 0 0.03. That's about 70 dB. 0.3 is about the square root of 10. 0.1 is about a tenth, is a tenth. 0.03 is about 10 to the minus 3 halves and so on like that. It's 10 dB every time you multiply by 3-ish. Yeah? Uh, aside from just knowing the, that knowledge, is there any other practical benefits to, to what you just showed us, the dB to RMS? Uh, well, there's this. There's this. Uh, now I can stop doing this and start doing Ooh, you're going to have to finish the garage and there are only five minutes to go, and I'll actually do this, but uh, in fact, what I'll do is I'll, I'll uh, quit doing the nice and just give me a number and give myself a number block, like this. Now I can say, give me 70 dB, please. Oops, and you can't hear anything going on the pitch here. So this 70, and not only is that easier, but also at this point I've got something that sort of behaves reasonably as a control. If I can mouse on this without him hitting the shift key, that's a good thing. And furthermore, every time I push this by a fixed amount, like 10, say, it gets the same amount louder as the last time I pushed it by 10. So if you like 5 dB and 5 or 10 dB is a musical dynamic. If you think in terms of there's six dynamics all the way from triple F to seven, triple F to triple P. Well, that might be if you think that that's a 35 decibel range of loudnesses, 30. Then make make it be 5 dB per dynamic, and then you've got a decent way of controlling dynamic that doesn't have you typing lots of decimals. Unfortunately, uh, what this would mean is that 0 should be 10 to the minus 5, but the dB to RMS object cheats, and when you say 0, it gives you a true 0 out, so you can just turn the thing off, I guess. That's important, because otherwise, it being digital, even if you had an amplitude of minus 10 to the 10th, it might be going doing 0 crossings, and it might still make its way to your speaker. So zero is true zero, but as soon as you get off of zero, it starts giving you real numbers. Oops, if it's too small to show. Yeah. Okay, about there. Oh boy. See, I need to make this number box fatter again. Okay, now zero is zero, but one dB is, you know, about 10 to the minus five. 20 dB is 10 to the minus 4, and so on like that. Right. And negative dB are just truncated to 0, too. You can tell this thing more than 100. I'm not going to do it right now because it's connected to sound. But a, if 100 is 0 dB, then 120, sorry, if 100 dB is, is an amplitude of 1, then 120 dB is an amplitude of 10 which is too loud to play, but not too loud to think about. Maybe you're going to attenuate it later, right? And 140 is an amplitude of 100 and so on like that. All right. Questions about that? 30 seconds. So those are acoustical units, and that was table lookups and phases.